Andreas for the opportunity to talk to you guys today. Um, let me just do this full screen. Good. Yeah, so today I will talk about structural studies of non-structural proteins from the SARS coronavirus 2. Um, I am heading the DMAX platform uh, within the scientific activities division. Um, and I invite all of you, if you're interested, to go to insidecorona.net. There are amazingly interesting resources to understand all the structural efforts going on to unravel uh, the mysteries of this virus. And for 3D printing enthusiasts, there are all the full plans to 3D print your own life-size, uh, okay, not life-size, football-sized uh, coronavirus capsid, if you are so inclined. So I will give a brief introduction to coronaviruses. Uh, we'll take a look at the SARS viral capsid structure, as well as its genome to better understand how this virus replicates and all the proteins that it produces uh, when it is infecting us. So we'll look at viral replication as well as the life cycle and the global efforts going on to combat and fight particular steps in the viral life cycle. Then we'll go to the DMAX uh, supported project on some of the non-structural proteins from SARS. I'll give a very brief overview of the project, some of the results where we are today and a little forward looking view on where we would like to go next. And then at the very end, I have compiled a set of slides on the various vaccine efforts. I think people are very keenly interested um, in what may be coming to an arm near you very soon. So if there is time at the end, I'm gladly showing you all the, the various efforts and we can, we can maybe discuss some of that if anyone is interested. So coronaviruses, these are in fact a very large family of viruses that um, infect many types of avian and mammalian species uh, from turkeys to even whales uh, can have coronavirus uh, infections. And it is known that these viruses have made cross species jumps many, many times in its evolution between different host types. It is thought by evolutionary biologists that the human coronavirus as a pathogen diverged from animal coronaviruses well over a thousand years ago. So these have been around for a long time and we have been living with them, perhaps unknowingly, for quite some time as well. The first uh, coronavirus was um, discovered in the 1930s as an avian bronchitis virus. And the first human pathogen was um, isolated in 1966. And the first uh, sequence for its genome was in 1987. So it has been quite some decades of us having knowledge about these viruses and where they are and how they look. Some in humans, there are seven uh, known coronaviruses that infect and cause disease. Uh, of course, some are very serious human pathogens. We can think of the SARS and MERS uh, epidemics in recent history. And of course, currently the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic that is ongoing with a yet uh, unknown fatality rate. Um, Four of the other human pathogenic coronaviruses are considered less serious, especially in immunocompetent people. And these in fact circulate annually. They come around like flu and cold season. And they often appear as co-infections with other viruses. And you can see the, sorry, let me do this. And you can see um, these are the names of the four variants uh, that, that we know circulate annually. In fact, these are so common, it is known that upwards of 35% of all upper respiratory tract infections occurring globally annually are in fact caused by coronavirus. And as much as 15% of what we call the common cold is not just caused by rhinovirus, but is actually also caused by one of these four coronaviruses. Infections manifest in many organs. Uh, we of course think primarily of the respiratory tract but they can also infect uh, the gastrointestinal uh, region, central nervous system, uh, as well as the reproductive tract. So here are a set of images that show you models of the SARS coronavirus uh, capsid, how the, the actual virus looks and how its structure is organized. Uh, this cartoon is of course very cartoonish, but it shows very nicely um, the different components of the lipid capsid. And we see that it is an enveloped virus, meaning it has a host derived uh, lipid membrane and embedded in this membrane are a series of virally encoded structural proteins. 
You have all by now heard of the spike protein. It is talked about a lot in the media. It is this big guy. More realistically, it looks more like these little broccoli stalks. It's a very large uh, protein and it decorates the surface and gives it the corona appearance. Then there are also membrane protein, uh, envelope glycoprotein, and inside the capsid, we have something called the N protein. This is the nucleocapsid protein. Its job is to form a helical structure to organize and protect the, the genome of the, the SARS coronavirus. Um, and you can see multiple copies of it are wrapping around uh, the genome. The S protein is, is very important for vaccines and immunity against these viruses. Small amino acid changes in S protein slightly can affect the structure and have dramatic effects on what kind of host or tissue type this particular coronavirus may be able to, to infect. So knowledge of the spike protein, especially how it looks before the virus enters the body is really important for, for vaccine or immune response to, to this virus. Because these are enveloped viruses, they don't have a fixed icosahedral shape like we would think of for many other viruses. Uh, they are instead pleomorphic, which means they can vary quite a bit in their shape and size, um, between 80 and 120 nanometers in diameter. Inside the capsid, we know that the virus packages uh, quite a large genome, 30 uh, kilobases is a lot. Uh, for example, uh, human hepatitis virus has a genome that is 10 times smaller, whereas HIV has a, a genome that is about nine kilobases. So coronaviruses really have quite a shockingly large uh, genome, one of the largest. So to understand how the virus uses this genomic material, first I need to just give a really basic um, bit of knowledge for you to understand how we go from DNA all the way to proteins. Um, here we see the very, very uh, canonical textbook explanation for how we do that in eukaryotes. And this process is called transcription and translation. In transcription step, uh, we produce messenger RNA from our genomic double-stranded DNA through an enzyme called RNA polymerase. This mRNA, the pink part, undergoes then a process of translation uh, to produce the polypeptide. And the synthesis is done by a whole a host of protein production machinery at the center, which is, the, of course, the ribosome. Viruses don't just stick to this uh, very rigid plan. They actually are quite creative in how, uh, what kind of genome they may have. They can have double-stranded DNA genome, single-stranded DNA genome, double-stranded RNA, and also single-stranded uh, RNA um, genomes. And the genomic material that a virus packages uh, really dictates and determines how and where in the cell uh, they are able to replicate and, almost, and also how much work is involved. Uh, for SARS coronavirus, they in fact package an mRNA single-stranded uh, genome, which means they bypass uh, this transcription set and they can immediately uh, go for translation in the host cell. If we take a closer look at the genome organization, first of all, we see this very large genome and a whole number of genetic elements that code uh, for a huge number of viral proteins. So you can say uh, viruses with smaller genomes rely on the host cell to provide them all the machinery they need to copy themselves. Uh, SARS is interesting in that it packs all its own things. It doesn't, uh, it, it really brings a lot of its own uh, proteins to do the job of replicating itself. On the three prime end, uh, we see a number of elements that code for these structural proteins. We see here the gene uh, for S and M and E and N proteins, and a number of accessory proteins whose functions are largely unknown in fact, but we do know these proteins work to drive the pathogenicity of a particular virus. On the five prime end, uh, we have these two large open reading frames that together code for a huge set of proteins shown here. ORF uh, 1A and 1B are then translated into two very large polyproteins containing non-structural proteins one through 16. Embedded in these are two very important enzymes, they're proteases, whose job it is to essentially digest or process these polyproteins and liberate individual NSP proteins who then have a variety of jobs. Um, and here you can see PL-PRO and M-PRO. 
um, and all the NSPs. Together, collectively, their main job seems to be the business of copying with very high accuracy the, the viral genome and processing it and helping it to package properly in offspring viral capsids. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of these NSPs. So if we look at the virus life cycle, here we see a, a coronavirus uh, molecule or uh, capsid approaching the host cell. Spike protein is the, the main viral protein that helps the virus dock to the host cell membrane. In human uh, respiratory system, the, the receptor is ACE2. ACE2 itself is a protease and it actually modifies spike protein. So undergoes a radical structural change that completely changes how it looks and it allows fusion of the, the virus with the membrane. And it is in fact the structure of spike pre-fusion, this version, not the one that is already here modified that is important for vaccine development and for um, developing an immune response. Once the genome is in the cell, now all the business can start of copying the genome, but also producing proteins, the viral proteins that it codes for all the NSPs, accessory proteins, as well as the structural proteins. Um, infection with coronavirus also generates these double membrane vesicles who then assemble complicated machinery to, to essentially copy the genome in secret. So it's kind of hidden and shielded from the rest of the cell. These then eventually fuse with other membranous compartments that contain this, um, the structural proteins, creating new viruses that are extruded through exocytosis. In this article, and I show the reference here at the bottom, uh, they take a really good look at the, the red boxes shown here. And these are the areas in the viral life cycle that are being targeted uh, for massive drug repurposing studies. So here, many, many people across the globe are looking at existing approved and drugs that are used in the clinic, maybe for other things, to see if they may have an effect on any of the steps here. And some of these you have heard a lot about. Um, of course, we, we know about S protein and vaccine development, and I can say more about that part later, but um, it is thought that hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, they are endosomal pH disruptors, and it was thought that maybe they can help to, to slow down or change or just stop the, the viral capsid from being uncoated. Uh, there's also nucleoside analogs. There are several, I just uh, mentioned remdesivir here. That one was also mentioned in the media a lot. It is a nucleoside analog, and it is actually uh, able to be incorporated into copies of the, the viral genome into the RNA, uh, but it is not a proper nucleotide, and it will actually stall the process uh, of copying the genome. And then uh, researchers are looking uh, to, for example, HIV protease inhibitors, because we have many, many of them that have been used in clinic for decades, <clears throat> to see if any of them have any effect on those two viral proteases from SARS coronavirus. And so far, several large uh, clinical trials have concluded on remdesivir and hydroxychloroquine. And unfortunately, we don't seem yet to have a magic bullet uh, out of all these drug repurposing studies. So with that bit of background, I can now tell you about the DMAX project. Uh, earlier this year, we published a special call inviting the user community to let us know if we can help them with any of their COVID-19 related <clears throat> proposals. Uh, DMAX together with LP3 at Lund University are supporting two projects. <coughs> Excuse me. They came as individual requests and we sort of managed to combine them into one big project. So I show them here at the bottom. Uh, one group from University College London approached us for support uh, for protein production and crystallization of some of these NSPs. And we had a, a group from the MLZ in Munich coming very interested to do SANS on some of the NSPs. Well, it turns out the NSPs were the same. So we, um, we combined uh, the projects into a, a large uh, collaboration. So the work we are doing are really focused on the structural studies of three of those non-structural proteins from SARS coronavirus 2. These are NSP 10, 14, and 16. NSP 14 and 16 have the main job that they are methyl transferases. So they add small CH3 or methyl groups to two different areas on the, the RNA genome. 
And the main purpose of this is to essentially disguise the viral RNA because human RNAs are also methylated. So if they methylate the viral genome, it looks like our own and our body ignores it. NSP14 has an additional enzymatic activity. It has an exoribonuclease activity, and it is part of the very important proofreading capability that this virus has. It has a very large genome it has to copy. There's a lot of room for mistakes. NSP14 is one of those enzymes that actually surveils and checks the fidelity of the copied genome. And the reason, and this is one of the reasons also why this virus tends to accumulate mutations very slowly compared to other viruses, because it actually checks, it checks each and every copy of its RNA. So NSP14 is probably also the reason why drugs like remdesivir is unable to work, because as soon as uh, incorrect nucleoside is incorporated into the RNA, NSP14 will scan that daughter piece of genome and find it and in fact excise it. So um, yeah, so the, anyway, yeah, more about NSP14 next. NSP10 is the third player in this triad. Um, it is not an enzyme, but it is an activator and a scaffolding protein that is absolutely required for either NSP14 or 16 to be active. And we know if we can block it or knock it out, these two enzymes uh, can't do their job. Also, NSP10 is an attractive target from a drug perspective uh, because it is absent in bacteria or mammals and seems unique to coronaviruses. Um, so that, that makes it an interesting target where we, we, can, we can target it, but maybe not hit every similar looking proteins uh, in our bodies. So here we have uh, examples of crystal structures that are known for, for the three NSPs. Uh, from the first SARS uh, epidemic, there came crystal structures of NSP10, shown here as this ribbon, in complex with NSP14, shown in cyan. And you can see the two domains uh, that correspond to those two different enzymatic activities. Uh, earlier this year for SARS-CoV-2, there was a crystal structure determined of NSP16 in pink uh, in complex with this NSP10 again. And we were able to report the first uh, crystal structure of NSP10 by itself. So not in complex with the binding partner uh, of SARS-CoV-2 this year. So our goal is to study these, these three uh, systems. And ultimately, we would like to find small molecule inhibitors, things that look like drugs, so not vaccines, instead something you would take orally, for example, uh, to bind to the surface of NSP10. And maybe we can then block it assembling with either 14 or 16 if we can interfere with that surface-surface interaction. And then we also have a chance to look inside the active site of the NSP14 and 16 enzymatic activities. And ultimately, we would then also, of course, like to characterize uh, how these molecules may bind and how they may work to interfere uh, the activity. The anticipated effect is that we can block the virus uh, doing this RNA modification and hiding of its genome and allow our cells to detect and destroy the virus. And if we are able to disrupt NSP14, we can actually disrupt this proofreading activity and nucleoside analogs, for example, remdesivir, have then a chance to work. So you can see like for HIV, uh, cocktail tri-therapies involve multiple inhibitors that knock different parts of the viral life cycle. Here we are going for a similar idea where you could administer two or three things at the same time that take out different uh, functional components of the, the virus. We've done quite a bit of work in a reasonably short amount of time. So far with the LP3, we have been able to establish um, robust protein production procedures for the three different NSPs. Uh, we've also been able to do uh, biophysical characterization of these proteins by a number of, of methods uh, available to us at LU. And we were also quite lucky early on to get very nice crystals of NSP10. You can see these beautiful uh, cubes here. And thanks to Max for rapid access for COVID projects, we were able to get uh, beam time at Biomax very quickly and early on in this project. And we were able to determine two very nice high resolution crystal structures of NSP10. And this work, the structures along with the biophysical characterization was published a little while ago. So we have moved forward quite quickly now with the project. Uh, we are now very much focused on NSP14 and 10 as a complex. 
and we are screening uh, for small molecule inhibitors. And there are multiple ways to, to do this. Um, we are using uh, two different technologies. One is the fragment-based screening platform available at MaxLab, where you screen for fragments of small molecules using crystals, and you use X-ray crystallography in a high throughput way to, to quickly screen for any binding. With Saromics, a local biotech company, we are using weak affinity uh, chromatography to assess small molecule binding in solution. So you don't need crystals for this. We've had some good promising hits uh, coming out of these. Um, and now we have to cross check and verify um, them. And that will be quite a lengthy procedure. And then finally, in parallel, we are also now pursuing and planning for SACS experiments on the NSP 1014 complex. And that will lay the groundwork for us to plan for the next set of solution scattering uh, experiments involving SANS. And the idea is here that we can understand not in a crystal, but under physiological conditions, how these, these proteins look and how they behave and how we may disrupt them if we challenge them with some of these small molecules we identify from these screens. So the, the next steps required to continue this work are, are many uh, and they are quite complex and each step requires a lot of work. Um, we really need uh, integrated workflow all the way from the materials, whether it's the proteins or the, um, the small molecule libraries, all the way to all the methods we need to verify and understand what it is we're seeing. To do this, we've established now a very large collaboration uh, between Frank's group at University College London, Wolfgang and the LP3, us at DMAX, we have Vladimir at Fragmax at MAX4, uh, Tobias and Maria Lucia at MLZ in Munich, and also Björn and Martina at Saromix and Medlead in Medicon Village. Uh, we have together written several grants and applied uh, at many different places, but no luck so far. So a lot of the work, a lot of people are uh, contributing to this effort is coming as in kind at the moment. And the hope is we get enough preliminary results so that we can be competitive uh, for uh, future applications. Uh, we did have an interview with Venuova on our grant and it was very clear they are very keen at the moment to only fund things that give them a tangible payoff in 12 to 18 months. If we consider the the normal timeline you need to develop a drug from scratch, which is essentially what we're trying. The duration is typically 12 to 17 years and can cost close to 2 billion euros. Uh, the work we are proposing to do is in this one to four year range, but apparently for the funding bodies, that's not uh, fast enough. Um, but we are, we are making huge strides here. And like I said, we are really aiming for solid uh, initial results to lay the groundwork here to pursue uh, further funding. Finally, just a, a note, my last slide for this topic is to just say large scale facilities have really revolutionized and changed drug design and vaccine design probably in the last decade or two. Structure based drug design based on X-ray crystal structures from synchrotrons has enabled and accelerated the development of many drugs used today in the clinic. HIV drugs, drugs used for hypertension and glycoma have all essentially been designed and improved based on the knowledge uh, gleaned through um, high resolution crystal structures. The same for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, these mRNA based vaccines, um, they actually relied on cryo EM and crystal structures of the spike protein to inform the design uh, of their vaccine. And they credit the availability of these structures to really making the, the effort go as fast as it did uh, for them since the first sequence for the spike was known and then the structures followed very quickly thereafter, they were able to mobilize uh, their platform based on the availability of these structures. And I will predict that supplementing this kind of work that is a standard way of working uh, for drug design in pharmaceutical companies uh, with neutrons will accelerate and make the process probably a lot cheaper as well, because we will be able to show hydrogen atoms, hydrogen bonds, electrostatics, all those interactions that are really important for understanding how a drug binds uh, to its target. So there's a couple of really good reviews, if anybody is interested. This one is especially interesting about structure-based vaccine design. Um, it's two years old, but they already mentioned coronavirus vaccines in that paper. Um, and here is an excellent review and quite detailed on the, the power and the role of X-ray crystallography and drug design for pharmaceutical companies. Finally, thanks to Andreas and Arno for being super supportive and encouraging for this project. 
And finally, none of this would be possible without Wolfgang Knecht at the LP3 at Lund University. DMAX and LP3 have a very special collaboration relationship and it is thanks to that interaction that we were able to, to mobilize this massive effort so quickly. And Wolfgang is incredibly good project manager, keeping us focused and also being very proactive about looking for funding opportunities. So a huge uh, thanks to him. Then finally, I have some slides on vaccines. So I'm looking to Sindra, is it okay uh, to continue? Okay. <laughs> So a lot of news in the vaccines. We know that Britain just started, or sorry, the UK just started uh, vaccinating people. And so I thought it is probably very timely to say a few things about this. Uh, from October in Nature, there was an excellent uh, review of all the vaccine efforts and current status. So I invite you to, to look this up. It is, um, yeah. It's a good read. So here in this paper, they compare tra traditional development of vaccines, which tend to take same as developing a new drug up to 15 years to develop a, a new vaccine. Um, and you can see all the various steps required and you can easily guess why it takes so long. Um, for the current development, we've seen a massive compression in the schedule. And uh, there are several reasons uh, why this is possible. First of all, there's a lot of pre-existing research existing from the first epidemics on SARS and MERS. So we, we have learned a few things in those days uh, that have persisted and actually helped us uh, be a little bit ahead uh, of this virus under the current conditions. Also, a lot of the vaccines being developed are relying on known and accepted platforms and technologies. So the, the pre-clinical part of a lot of this research has been sort of compressed. For others, the mRNA-based uh, vaccines that are completely new, companies like Moderna have spent over 10 years developing. They have been in this phase of mRNA vaccine design for over 10 years. So they were essentially ready and they were in fact getting ready to start phase one clinical trials of some other type of vaccine they're developing. When the spike protein structure came out, they were able to quickly retool basically for coronavirus. A couple of things that are happening here that I find slightly alarming is that they are now overlapping uh, clinical trials. Before you would have phase one conclude, there would be a lengthy safety review, you would apply for permission to start with the next phase. Now they are really uh, stacking these up with, and they're not waiting for a, a particular phase to finish before starting the next one. And many companies have uh, signed these massive government contracts to allow them to start production of huge amounts of doses of vaccines before they are even approved. <laughs> so there's a lot of things happening in parallel, of course, a lot of money being pumped into this process at the moment. And I think, yeah, that's obviously the reason why we're seeing this massive uh, compaction. So uh, to get an immune response, of course, we need to, to stimulate the, the, anti, the antibody producing cells in our bodies. One of the primary actors here is antigen presenting cells in the body. They will ingest a coronavirus capsid partially digested and then display peptides or parts of the virus on their surface. T helper cells come about, they see these and they send out the alarm signals to activate cytotoxic T cells shown down here, um, as well as B cells that are the, the main antibody factories uh, in our bodies. And they will produce uh, anti-coronavirus antibodies to the antigen, this red bit that it was first confronted with uh, up here. Now, to develop long-lived immunity, uh, you need B and T cells that persist in the body and that are ready to react whenever uh, confronted with this particular pathogen again. And this type of immunity can last anywhere from months uh, to years. Unfortunately, the experts think uh, because coronaviruses, those four human pathogens I showed you in the beginning, these come around year after year after year. Uh, so there isn't... Um, a lot of evidence to suggest that we do build up long-term, long-lived immunity against these. And it may very well be like the annual flu vaccine or something like this, that we would have to get vaccinated quite frequently uh, against this thing. So this uh, figure over here from this nature paper shows uh, all the different technologies that are currently being pursued uh, for vaccine development against uh, SARS coronavirus. And there are many private uh, and public uh, entities aggressively pursuing all these various technologies. 
So the first one, the one we all are at least maybe not aware of, but you've all had, <laughs> is the virus-based vaccines. Um, they are these two companies. I think they are Chinese, Sinovac and Sinopharm. Uh, they use inactivated SARS coronavirus to, to make uh, a vaccine. Several vaccines of this nature have existed for many decades. Polio, hepatitis A and rabies vaccines are examples of inactivated virus vaccines uh, based on this technology. Then we also have, of course, weakened viruses, and there is a group looking to do this. Here you essentially culture the, the SARS coronavirus or any virus, uh, either in animals or in tissue culture, for many, 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 many passages until they accumulate enough mutations that they are weakened, but enough of them remain that they can still replicate in our bodies and elicit an immune response. And this is really old school way of generating um, vaccines. Measles was developed in this way in the 1950s and that took 10 years of continuously culturing in a lab before they had a weakened measles uh, virus that could serve uh, as a vaccine. Then we also have uh, accepted technologies that are protein-based vaccines. This is where you in a lab produce artificially the bits of the coronavirus proteins, in this case spike and M protein, that membrane protein, and then you can inject these back into the body uh, as a vaccine. GSK, Sanofi, they are using this technology for SARS. Sanofi also uses this technology to make the annual flu vaccine. So if you have been for a, a flu vaccine this year, you've had a protein-based vaccine. Then there's also virus-like particles. Um, these are a little trickier to make. I think they're quite expensive. They, they look like synthetic virus capsids, but they're empty lipid uh, shells or vesicles in which you then embed spike protein. Uh, but these, um, yeah, they trigger quite a strong immune response, but there are difficulties with manufacturing uh, these. Uh, human uh, hepatitis B and HPV, uh, human papillomavirus vaccines are based on this technology. And like I said, the flu vaccine for the protein one is this, uh, but also if you've had a shingles booster shot, then you've also had a protein-based vaccine. Then we come to the, the new stuff where uh, things get a little less uh, accepted, <laughs> we can say. Uh, on the one side here, we have viral vector vaccines. Here you have two options. You can use uh, a viral vector, vector just meaning it's a delivery system. Uh, in all cases, I think they're using other viruses to deliver spike uh, gene to in a vaccine form. And very recently, an Ebola vaccine was approved. That is the first uh, based on a weakened measles virus that is delivering uh, genes for coronavirus. What can possibly go wrong? Uh, for non-replicating viral vectors, uh, there is a lot of work going on. Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, as well as the Russian Sputnik V uh, vaccines are based on this technology. Here they are using adenovirus, uh, which is which is kind of a good one to use because you can target adenovirus to these APC cells directly. Um, adenovirus is also a known uh, virus that infects humans, but it is not pathogenic. Um, and yeah, uh, but no licensed vaccines existing for this one. Uh, but uh, I think we can expect most of these to be approved very, very quickly, um, very soon at least. Um, I know they have applied for licenses at the end of November, so we'll see. There will probably be a decision very soon. And then we get to the nucleic acid vaccines. Um, again, no, no um, accepted or vaccines in use based on this technology, but the two huge front runners that show very efficacious vaccines are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And these are based on RNA. So they have bits of RNA that code for the spike protein or parts of the spike protein. These are encased in a, in a lipid shell and then um, injected like, like that. Um, so that is uh, what I had. Finally, I just end on this slide here. Also a recent article, October uh, yeah, from Nature shows a very nice summary of all the relative advantages and disadvantages of the variety of vaccines. Um, and you're welcome to read these and I guess have your own opinions about what you are willing to <laughs> to get, I guess, if we get a choice. So with that, I am finished. Thank you very much, Zoe, for that very interesting and uh, uh, highly timely talk. Uh, we've uh, gone past our time a little bit, but uh, I'm still uh, hoping there might be some questions for Zoe on this topic. 
Phil? Yeah, it was a super interesting talk. I have a, a slightly general question. If you use a drug to target the proofreading mechanism, does that then uh, induce more mutations which are likely to change the nature of the pathogen itself? Uh, yes, that is a risk. Most mutations accumulated by viruses actually weaken them. It has to be a rare mutation that actually makes it a better pathogen. The accumulation of uh, mutations is exactly what's behind creating weakened viruses for use in vaccines. But I think that is a, that is a concern and we would envision that to be in concert with something like remdesivir, a nucleoside analog that, that you would work uh, together to shut down replication and not just producing viruses that are accumulating mutations. Yeah, that's a... Esco? Um, yeah, thanks, Sorry. Uh, so the, um, the NSP10, uh, NSP1416 complex, how do you know the affinity there? Because it doesn't look like a, a typical chaperone type thing. So is it actually required for the, the enzymes to be active or, you know? Yes, there are a number of, a... Yeah. there's a number of um, cell-based assays and other in vitro assays where they show these enzymes are not, not active uh, without NSP10. And annoyingly, none of them seem to crystallize without NSP10. <laughs> so we don't know if it's a structural change or what is the nature of this activation. The affinity seems quite low. We have been not able to take the two individually produced proteins and combine them in the lab and get a complex. They come apart on size exclusion chromatography. And that is a concern. And the crystal structures were crystallized from proteins that were co-expressed and purified. So if you co-express them, it seems they have to be together from the moment they fold, actually. Um, and then they are very stable and seem to have quite high affinity and you can do all kinds of things to them and they don't come apart. So again, there to find a small molecule that can interrupt or insert into that interface, I think is a, is a big ask. This is not a not ambitious project, <laughs> I would say. I, I'm quite a slightly bigger fan of going after the enzymatic activity. Uh, for NSP14 or NSP14. But have you thought about something like uh, mRNAi or uh, something to stop the, uh, the NSP10 from, uh, or, or a, a peptide that would uh, bind to, to NSP10 to compete it or, you know? Yes, uh, there have been from the first SARS, people looked at peptide analogs and actually a mouse hepatitis virus, which is also a kind of coronavirus, they showed very effectively by using a peptide uh, that they were able to block assembly of NSP10 and I think it was NSP16. Um, so that methodology has been proven for SARS in at least in animals, um, but of course not for this one and not in humans. Yeah. Yeah, because if you're now in the situation that you can you can uh, modify genetic, you know, if you yes. allow that type of vaccines, you might as well use it for for therapy, right? If you're going to inject me with a, a, a measles corona hybrid, then I guess all bets are off. <laughs> so you're getting a lot of appreciation here in the chat function, uh, Zoe. I think people really enjoyed that talk. Uh, your slides mm -hmm. and recording will be available on the Confluence page. I hope we can have access to those slides. With all the yeah, I, I will send them. No worries. All right. Uh, for those of you who don't have a, a 3D printer available, I hope you've hey. seen the Swedish classical... Uh, Christmas decoration. It's a clementine with cloves. And everybody does this every year. And this year, people are thinking, hmm. Uh. <laughs> <Looks really good. laughs> but it smells nice. Uh, do we have any more questions for Zoe? Or should we move on to lunch, perhaps? I believe that that is it for now. For Zoe, I'm sure you'll get follow-up questions later as well. Uh, thanks for a great talk and, and uh, thank you for all the talks uh, this morning. Andreas, would you like to